Welcome everyone back to AE311 and today we are going to talk about one of my favorite aspects of lighting luminaires or gear really um so we'll uh we'll dig through it but what I want to start with is our roadmap so this is the same roadmap um that we were looking at with our light sources uh light sources lecture however I want to tweak this just a little bit so we have our basic two key elements, right? We have our luminaire and our lamp. Now, taking a look in a little more detail, right? We can consider with the luminaire, uh, the housing, the mounting, and the finish. And these are all configurable elements for architectural luminaires. So when we're looking at the housing, some of the big questions you wanna ask is, are you concerned about vandalism? Are you concerned about environmental ingress, water, dust? Actually, in some environments, we have acid-resistant luminaires. Um, when we're looking at the mounting, the big question is, how are you going to attach the luminaire to your interior or your exterior, either one for that matter, but how are you going to attach that luminaire and get it positioned so that it's providing the light you designed it to provide? Uh, the finish. Right there, we're looking at how you integrate the luminaire within the greater architecture of the building. When we're talking about lamping, which honestly, as we discussed um, on Monday, lamping is almost a thing of the past with a lot of newer luminaires becoming uh, LED integral, meaning that the there's not a separate lamp, but rather the light source itself is just integrated within the entire luminaire and we typically see a lot better performance. That said, we can still break down the components here. We can consider the source. The questions we're asking there is how bright, what CCT, what color rendering properties do we need? The power supply, which for LEDs is going to be a driver. Uh, for fluorescence, it's a ballast. Uh, for um, HIDs, it's a ballast. Either way, the, the device you're using to supply the correct power to your light source um, is going to determine things like the voltage and, more importantly, how you control that luminaire because controls need to interface with the driver or ballast. And we can look at optics. So optics are a part of all aspects of the luminaire, including both the luminaire and the lamp. And so there's several common elements, uh, including, of course, what I have listed there, baffles, louvers, shielding, diffusers, reflectors, lenses. We're going to take a look at each of these and consider um, what they're doing for our luminaires and specifically here the questions we're asking is how can you prevent glare and what are you lighting where are you lighting it and what type of light do you need to light it with all of which we can modify with the optical components of a luminaire our first stop for any proper architectural luminaire is going to be uh, what we call a cut sheet or a spec sheet or a specification sheet. Those are all interchangeable terms. And the big thing here is that it's going to give us our model numbers. And so we can see right here that there's a variety of options, a ton of options. And this is a relatively common type of uh, linear pendant luminaire. And there's a lot of ways we can modify the configuration of this luminaire to suit our specific application. So the big thing here on the cut sheet is it's going to walk you through specifying your options. Um, it's also going to give you a final product number or order number. Uh, right here is an example of the way that's formatted for this particular luminaire. That's going to go on your fixture schedule. And it's also very important because when you actually order luminaires, Having this number right means you get what you want, not something else, something similar or something that won't work for your application. And finally, we need this, this order number or model number here in order to look up the correct IES file. 
So remember, the IS file is a description of the distribution of light. Essentially, it's a candela table with some additional supporting information. However, there's a lot of aspects on this cut sheet that are going to modify the distribution of light coming from this light source, meaning we need to specify the model number of the light source before we can get to the right IES file. So let's dig into that a little bit more on this specific thing, because you didn't think that was the whole cut sheet, did you? Right. So here is the expanded options. And this cut sheet is actually much more than just this table I'm showing you. This is the most important part, but cut sheets are typically four or five pages long, and it's going to include descriptions for all of these aspects so you understand what you're actually getting when you select these options. So I'll start right here with shielding. And shielding really in this case means the diffuser. And so if you were to look into this cut sheet um, on the, I actually on the first page, it's actually above this table. Um, on the first page, it shows you what that shielding really means. And that's a continuous roll lens, meaning that lens or diffuser in this case really um, can be run continuously down any length of luminaire come back to that thought in just a moment. Moving over to the lumen packages. So I picked this luminaire because you have a lot of options with how the light is distributed coming out of this luminaire. So over to my left here, we have the uplight lumen package, which is going to give you the distribution of light coming out of the top of that luminaire, right? So this is a pendant hung below the ceiling. And so the uplight is going up onto that ceiling to give you that feeling of spaciousness that Flynn defined so many years ago. So you can see that in the ISO Candela plot, and it's showing you exactly what kind of distribution you're getting. In this case, it's a fairly classic bat wing distribution, which means it's going to push light hard out to the sides so that it can spread and cover as much of the ceiling as possible, even when it's fairly close to the ceiling. And of course, over to my right, we have the downlight lumen package. So this is going to describe the distribution coming out of the bottom of the luminaire. And again, here's an example of an ISO candela plot, in this case for a downlight only lumen package in this luminaire. We can hop over here to color. And the, uh, the cut sheet actually gives us a little more detail on color beyond what's listed in this table below me. In fact, it even gives us our TM30 metrics. So that's nice to see. In the future, that's going to be really standard. But right now, I'm happy to see it on any of these cut sheets. So you can see uh, below me that the, um, the fidelity is good, but the gamut is also very solid, being just under 100. So we've got really robust color rendering, though I will point out right here, this is the CIE R9 value. So this is part of the color rendering index. R9 is specifically a red color sample, and those extremely low scores there are telling us that they did nothing to boost red rendition in this light source. We can take a look over here in these three sections. This is all of our electrical. So this ties back into the kind of driver we're using and the kind of power and circuiting that this light source expects and will be set up for when it's delivered to your project site. Here's the driver itself, driving and dimming options, which is also going to give you a very clear idea of what kind of control interface you're getting with this. For example, when you go down to the LH and L5, those are a Lutron version of the Dolly control interface. And so if you're designing your building with a Lutron ecosystem controller, then that's the kind of driver you're going to want on this luminaire. 
more and more we see integrated sensors on these luminaires, which is really cool because you can have an occupancy sensor on the luminaire itself. So the luminaire does its own sensing and can respond independently. Here's the finish types right here. And we're going to come back to that as well. We're going to come back to all of this. Um, but there's the finish types in their standard white, black, and silver. And here are your mounting options. So suspension type and length, uh, as well as the ceiling type, how you're going to attach it to your ceiling. And then lastly, we come to run length. And this is something I love about linears. You can connect them together to create runs of any length. So you can create solid lines of light throughout your project. And this is how you can just specify the lengths, snap them together, and use that continuous roll lens to create one solid line of light. Okay, so let's take a look at why we care about working through these specifications on the cut sheet before we start grabbing IES files. And that's why. In fact, for this particular luminaire, this is one quarter of the options because you can see up top here, this is actually only the IES files for the 3000K 80 CRI version. There's different CCTs and there's different CRIs available. So, you can quickly get ludicrous with this because the different lengths are going to change the distribution, the different output packages, the different distribution packages, both in the uplight and downlight. So work your way through the cut sheet first, because if you just go straight to the IS file, which one of these is reasonable? I have no idea. Neither do you. That said, once you have your model number selected from the cut sheet, it's relatively straightforward to find your way to the correct IES file, the IES file that you need for your specific project. Okay, let's dig into some of those specific configuration options, starting with the housing. So there's two major aspects we're concerned with on the housing, and that is ingress protection and tamper proofing. So it's very common, especially in institutional fixtures, that you can set it up with a tamper proof exterior, which is going to make it more difficult to get into that luminaire. Um, you can also get lenses and diffusers that can take a hit from a baseball bat. I've literally watched demos where they drove a truck over these things, like a, like a hemispherical lens, and they you can drive a truck right over that thing and it did not care. Just flexed and popped right back up. So you can do a lot with tamper proofing depending on the location you're installing the luminaire. But probably more interesting is ingress protection. And this will come, uh, come in handy for your projects given that you probably need to install luminaires above food stations. So that is an environment with specific ingress protection needs. So IP rating system. You're probably all familiar with IP68 rated, uh, rated devices. More and more phones are becoming IP68, which is really nice because I don't know about you, but I tend to be pretty destructive on my phones. So here's the basics of the system. I'm not going to go through every bit of this. Um, your textbook actually has a great write-up for this. Um, but the key things to point out here is the first number is dust protection. And as you increase that number, you're getting better and better dust protection for finer and finer particulate. Liquid protection is similar, and that's our second number. However, it's not quite such a linear scale. And I'll point this out because right here we have... so. In the five and the six, these are actually jets of water, which, as it turns out, is usually harder to harder to meet the standard for than 
uh, than long-term immersion. So IP66 uh, tends to be actually a more stringent standard because this is something you can hit with a fire hose and IP68 is something you can throw in a pool. Usually if you can hit it with a fire hose, you probably can throw it in a pool, but not necessarily the other way around. So that's our basic IP rating system. And you're definitely looking for something that is either IP66 or IP68 rated for your exterior luminaires. Mounting types. So there's a variety of mounting types that we utilize throughout architectural lighting designs. The most common are going to be recessed and pendant mounts. Now, recessed is, is probably the most standard. It's, it's elegant because most of that luminaire is hidden within the ceiling. So you only have to have one finished face on your luminaire. You don't have to have the whole package uh, with finished exterior surfaces. Um, this improves the cooling attributes, actually, is one of the big aspects of it. Uh, but also, it's less expensive that way, and it's more streamlined inside your building. So it's common and elegant. Pendant lighting has the big advantage of being able to provide uplight and downlight. So it gives you a lot more control over your distribution of light, whereas recessed lighting is going to be direct down only. Pendant lights are extremely versatile, but naturally you're going to need a little bit higher ceiling. So with nine or 10 foot ceilings, pendant lights probably are less viable. But if you have 14 foot ceilings, they are fantastic. And especially if you have a finished look on your ceiling, you can send light up onto it, bounce it back down and create that beautiful, totally shadowless ambient fill. Surface mounting is another super common approach. For exposed ceilings, typically you're going to go with surface mounted luminaires. And you can mount it surface to a ceiling or to a wall. And you've got pretty different luminaires that we utilize for each of those particular types of mounting. So we'll dig into those luminaire types in a couple slides. Then the last two mounting options I want to mention are track and yoke. So track lighting is common. And what's really nice about track lighting is that it's user aimable and adjustable. So if you have something like an art gallery that's going to be constantly reconfiguring their space, track lighting may be the only way to go because you're going to provide some recessed ambient fill light. But when you're targeting artwork that is going to change exhibit to exhibit, you need the actual users, the actual occupants and employees in that space to be able to aim and adjust those lights on an as needed basis. Same is true for yoke, uh, yoke mounted lighting, but let's be real here. Those aren't really architectural fixtures. I'm including that because most of my equipment is yoke mounted and, uh, and it's widespread use in both entertainment and theatrical markets. dimensions. You can very commonly configure the dimensions of your luminaire on the cut sheet. So the most obvious thing is just shapes and sizes. So oftentimes luminaires come in families of luminaires, like you see over to my right. So you can get them in round or square or a variety of sizes. Keep in mind that this changes our luminous aperture and therefore each of those luminaires over there is going to have a separate IES file for it. And in fact, if you have different output packages for each of these luminaires, now each of those shapes and each of those sizes each have a series of IES files. Again, why we need to specify our, specify our equipment on the cut sheet before we start just tossing IES files into our project. Troffers. Troffers come in very standardized dimensions, and that's because our, our typical drop ceilings come in very standardized dimensions. So what you're going to see here with, uh, with common troffers are two by four foot 
uh, luminaires, and that's going to basically take up the space of one large ceiling tile. You also have two foot by two foot luminaires, which is another extremely common type. Let's say you don't need that much light. You can actually just take up half of a ceiling tile with a one by four foot troffer. So those are some very common dimension options. And when you're specifying a recess troffer, you're oftentimes going to have the ability to choose between each of these. And also, you need to choose the correct one uh, from your selection of IES files again. And linears. I briefly mentioned this uh, earlier, but linears can typically be linked together to create long lines of light or geometric patterns on your ceiling. And you'll be able to specify them in a variety of lengths. Most linear pendants will come in, say, four, six, eight, and 12 foot sections, and you can recombine them to create lines of light of whatever length you need. and finish. So there's a huge range of finishes available. Um, in most luminaires, especially recessed luminaires, you're going to have your standard white, black, silver. Uh, however, for luminaires like sconces or, um, or pendants that are closer to the eye level than something that's recessed into the ceiling, you're going to have a huge array of options to match the interior finish of your building. So this does bring me back to your project. You have a lot of wood surfaces in your building. So you might consider sconces with a wood finish to them. So there are a variety of finishes available depending on how you wanna coordinate with your architect. But like so many of these options, remember that you don't necessarily get the same light output from them. So you can see this with the multipliers right here. A specular clear finish has the full output of the luminaire. But as you move down to these really dark finishes right here with the graphite and graphite haze, you can see that with a straight black, you're actually down below half of the light output because your reflector in that case is absorbing a lot of the light from your light source. So do bear in mind that sometimes the finishes when they're affecting your reflector are going to dramatically alter your light output. On sconces like these, you don't have to worry too much. In fact, these different finishes may not even have a different IES file. It just depends on where your finish actually is. Optics. We've got a lot of options in optics, but there are two primary functions with our optical control devices. Number one is glare control. And here are our options that help with glare control. You can add louvers. So these are the fins on a light source that, that, and what they do specifically is they block the high angle light. So that's the light um, between, so remember our vertical angles, straight down is zero degrees. And as we come up, we're increasing, the equator is at 90. So light coming across in that 90 degree plane has a high potential for direct glare, but it's not just 90. It's actually this whole high angle range between 60 and 90 that you want to try to cut off to prevent that direct view glare from happening in your space. Louvers are one of the best options for that, for that problem. And you can even get like the, this here where you have a reflective louver. So you're getting very little light loss by adding that glare control device to your luminaire. Baffles up here aren't necessarily quite as efficient as louvers. However, they provide a similar function. So if you don't want a reflector on your source, you can consider baffles and baffles again are going to cut off a lot of those high angle, uh, high angle glare viewpoints between 60 and 90 degrees vertical. Shielding is an obvious solution. Depends on what type of luminaire you're using. If it's just a downlight, shielding won't get you very far. Louvers are a much better option. 
But if it's a wall washer, like what I'm showing over there, shielding is a great option. And finally, diffusers. Diffusers are crucial for LEDs. They are crucial because the LEDs themselves are super intense, hateful little point sources uh, of light. And direct view of LEDs is hard on anyone's eyes, even if you're adapted to full daylight at the moment. So diffusers are the simplest and most widely used solution on that front. And it's simply going to spread that light out so that and block that direct view of those little tiny point sources inside. Now, diffusers are also a beam shaping device. And specifically, it's going to spread your light out so you're getting a much more even diffuse light from your fixture. And that's important because LEDs are inherently directional light sources. So the light coming straight off of an LED might have a very narrow beam angle until it gets to that diffuser and widens out much, much more. Reflectors are a great way to control and direct your light. So if you're trying to direct light to hit a specific target, then reflectors might be the way to go. You can also use reflectors to get asymmetric distributions to push light towards a wall, for example. And finally, lenses, which are one of the most efficient light control devices. Lenses give us absolutely infinite control over the shape of our beam. And what I'm showing over there is a TIR optic, which is a total internal reflectance. So that lens actually has nearly 100% efficiency light in to light out. So they can be very effective and can give us any shape of beam. And control configuration. Next week, next week. Also, calm down. We're not, we're not, we're not doing that. ETC is insane. We, we're we're going to do basic architectural control systems. It's a lot more comprehensible than that demon. Moving on to distribution of light. We have several commonly used systems to classify and describe the distribution of light coming from a light source. This is one of the most common ones. This is just simply our CIE classification system that groups lights into one of five categories, depending on whether they're entirely down all the way to entirely up and somewhere in between. So let's take a look at the CIE classification system. There are our classifications. Uh, so those are actually five different groupings, but there's a special case of the middle group called general diffuse. And we'll get to that in just a couple slides. Importantly, these are searchable terms with most manufacturer catalogs. So you can specifically look for a direct pendant or a indirect pendant or a semi-indirect pendant. These are things that are used to describe groups of lights and are therefore typically searchable terms. And you're going to often even see this in the name of a luminaire telling you right off the bat that you only get direct down from this particular luminaire because it's a direct pendant. So let's jump into those classifications and take a look at what each of them explicitly mean for our designs. Here we have the first category, which is direct. And these are defined uh, as light sources where more than 90% of the light is below that horizontal or equatorial plane. So every bit of light is from zero to 90. So these include, of course, all of our recessed fixtures, um, but they also include a lot of different, uh, different types of pendants, even sconces. And so direct is telling us it's direct down. Semi-direct semi is where we only have 60 to 90% of the light down. So these are primarily down lights with some light going up. And then moving on to general diffuse. 
general diffuse is a broad category that just describes all of our omnidirectional type light sources. So when you're talking about like a regular A lamp, uh, like the old school incandescent style A lamps, those are going to be general diffuse. There's all sorts of pendants and whatnot that fall into this category as well. But what's probably more interesting from a design perspective is the special case of general diffuse, which is direct indirect. Now, this is different because direct indirect is specifically sending light up and down, not everywhere. So typically what you're going to see is a pretty hard cutoff here right around this center belt. Um, those are our glare angles and the, the key aspect of how we're going to avoid that direct line of sight into the luminaire itself. And so you see a great example of that over on the, the bottom right with those sconces that are have those beautiful spray of light going up and down, and they're explicitly cutting off that equatorial region, which can be so problematic. Moving on to semi-indirect, it's exactly what you think it is. It's the opposite of semi-direct, where the majority, but not all of our light is going upward. And then our final option is indirect. And so indirect luminaires don't send any light down to the work plane. It's going to give you a really beautiful shadowless fill. However, you're going to have substantial losses by only having inner reflected light coming down to the work plane, no direct light. So there are trade-offs here, but nonetheless, these are in widespread use in a variety of applications. Probably not so much for visual acuity, but without a doubt to create that sense of spaciousness, indirect luminaires are great. So just to reiterate, these are commonly used terms to describe the uh, distribution of a type of luminaire or luminaire family, and they're often searchable within manufacturers' databases. So you can get yourself directly to the type of light you're looking for without having to dig through all of the pendants in their catalog. And here's another look at that. These are a series of renders uh, in AGI 32, which took one specific luminaire and, uh, and took each of the distribution options that were available for that luminaire. And you can see the difference in effect within a space. We have some systems of classification for directional luminaires. The simplest of those is simply going to be the beam angle. So when you see the beam angle listed for a luminaire, what that means is the angle of light. So keep in mind, these are going to be uh, vertical angles here, even though these directional sources are aimable and can be pointed wherever you like them to. So again, this is a directional or an actually symmetric luminaire. Things like spotlights, parabolic reflectors, so on and so forth. So we can describe that directional beam of light using beam angle, which is simply the angle spread, so the range of vertical angles between the points where the intensity falls to 50% of the maximum intensity at the center of the beam. So this beam center is always going to be our maximum or almost always going to be our maximum intensity. And at some point, it falls off to 50%. And that range is our beam angle. So this gives you an idea of how wide or how tight your beam is coming from that light source. We can add to that the field angle. Now, the field angle is typically considered waste light. So this zone down here outside of the beam angle, but within the field angle is basically uh, not what we consider our primary light coming from this source. 
it's also going to give us an idea of how hard the edge is. So if you're looking at like an ETC source four, which is a ellipsoidal spotlight, it has a hard edge, an absolutely crisp edge on the on that. So that's an example of something with a beam and field angle that is the same value. Most light sources won't be nearly that crisp. So what be, the difference between beam and field angle tells you is how hard the edge of your source is. And the way we define field angle is similarly to the way we define beam angle, but instead of the point of where we reach 50%, we're looking at the point where we reach 10% of maximum. And so our field angle is between the 10% and the other 10%. A related classification system that is used specifically for sports luminaires is the NEMA classification system. And so the NEMA classification system takes this concept of beam angles and field angles and bends them into beam types from one to seven. And specifically, this is tying it back to the concept of throw distance or how far uh, your visual target is from your light source. And so this helps you uh, generally categorize different types of sports luminaires uh, based on how far away you are from the place you're lighting. This isn't super helpful in this class, but I did want to include this because this is widely used for spots and floods. One more classification system for distribution that I want to briefly touch on is the bug rating system. Now, the bug rating system comes from the model lighting ordinance, which I linked above me right here. And I don't wanna go a whole lot into this um, other than to explain what the B, U, and G are referring to. But the basic idea here with the model lighting ordinance is it's a system that allows you to quantify light pollution so that you can take steps to minimize it in your exterior lighting. So. In other words, the bug rating is typically used to classify exterior luminaires only. Um, so specifically, uh, usually that's going to be like road lighting or path lighting. So all the area floods, this becomes really important for, uh, as well as a lot of exterior site lighting. So things that are mounted on the, the facade of your building, for example. So the B refers to backlight, and this is primarily a concern with respect to light trespass. So if you have a source that's emitting light directly backwards, straight off the edge of your property line, you might be lighting someone's bedroom, or best case scenario, you're just adding stray light onto someone else's property that they don't want and they can't control. So light trespass is typically defined uh, by these angles right here, the angles behind the light source uh, that are potentially leaving the boundary of your property. We can move on to uplight. So uplight is anything emitted above that, that equatorial plane, if you will. So anything above 90 degrees vertical is up light. And this is just straight up light pollution. So, you know, for example, our football stadium, which is the most egregious form of light pollution I think I've seen. And that includes like Times Square, like, come on, really? And state? Anyways, up light uh, contributes to sky glow. Uh, and also it contributes a lot to disruption of habitats for animals. And finally, the G in bug rating is for glare, and that is our glare zone, again, between 60 and 90. And the high angle glare right here, 80 to 90, is considered the most egregious zone. So that's why they have a separate zone there, and that counts against you even more in your bug rating than the 60 to 80 range. But that whole area there on both sides, uh, you know, going around your whole luminaire in all directions is your glare zone between 60 and 90 degrees vertical.
So if you're interested in light pollution, then um, by all means, take a look, click the link uh, there. You can see the model lighting ordinance. Um, it's also something that is called out explicitly in the lead rating system. And the model lighting ordinance is a collaboration between the IES, the Illumination Engineering Society, and the, the National Dark Sky Association. Okay, we're gonna move through these reasonably quickly, but I mostly want to give you some basic familiarity with these, let's call them vocabulary terms. Again, like the distribution terms, the direct, indirect, semi-direct, so on and so forth, uh, these are all going to be searchable terms when you're digging through manufacturers' catalogs of luminaires. And so I wanna introduce you to these things so you know what you're getting and how to zero in on what you need for your lighting design work. Start with troffers. Troffers are the workhorses in one of, of your lighting design and one of the most common uh, forms of light source available. Typically, you're looking at direct distributions. These are almost entirely used for ambient lighting, so this is gonna fill your light uh, fill your space with light. Um, they don't necessarily have to be recessed. You, there's also surface mounted troffers, but most commonly uh, they're going to be recessed. Um, you also can get different types of distributions. So you have volumetric uh, troffers, which is which are particularly good for lighting both vertical and horizontal surfaces. So it pushes it out. Uh, more to the sides rather than straight down. You also have parabolic uh, parabolic troffers, which cut off some angles that commonly create glare on computer screens. Now, with all of the anti-glare treatments that we give screens nowadays, and the fact that they're flat screens, not curved like the you know those ancient dinosaurs that we call CRTs, um, this is less of an issue than it used to be. But nonetheless, you can still get parabolic troffers designed to reduce glare. And again, these are typically coming in dimensions of two feet by four feet, which is one large ceiling tile in the US, uh, or two foot by two foot, which are those smaller square ceiling tiles, or a more linear type of form factor in one foot by four foot configuration. Downlights. Um, so downlights specifically are referring to direct distribution, um, fairly, fairly narrow. Uh, oftentimes they can, uh, they're usually used for task, uh, sometimes for ambient light. Um, but a lot of times what you're doing with them is you're targeting a point of interest, making it a task or an accent light. You can get them in asymmetric uh, arrangements like this right here, where you can actually just tilt it to aim it towards a wall or aim it towards anything else you want to hit. Um, they come in square and round form factors. So it really depends on your architecture, which one you want to utilize. Um, and the asymmetrics, by the way, aren't just these pivot aiming ones. You can actually get reflectors that are asymmetric themselves so you can get a totally uniform look, unless you're looking real closely, and still get that asymmetric distribution that pushes light towards the wall. And again, you are going to be fairly interested in glare control here, so you can do that with baffles. A reflector actually increases your potential for glare, with the trade-off that you're typically going to get quite a bit more light out of it. So if you're aiming this thing at a wall and there's not a whole lot of potential for glare, you definitely go with the reflector route rather than the baffle route. Whereas if you're using it for ambient light in the middle of your space, you might go with baffles to help cut down on the glare potential. Strips and linear lights. Uh, these are also going to include your pendants. Um, these are an extremely common type of light source becoming more and more common. 
these are going to give you a ton of creativity. I'm a big fan of them. So they'll come in any distribution type you want, especially the pendant versions. Um, Typically, the application here is ambient light, though you can get these things in asymmetric distributions, again, for uh, wall washing and wall grazing, which is actually another specific type of application. Uh, but this is more talking about the form factor uh, rather, than, rather than the application of grazing or washing. Um, and you can, again, link these together. You have a variety of options, primarily lensing, but also uh, louvers and diffusers to manage your glare and beam shaping. And you're usually looking at a linear aperture for this, which gives you these long lines of light like you see right here. Wall washers are a specific type of light that might uh, cross over into downlights uh, or linears. Um, so wall washers are specifically something that's set back some distance from the wall, uh, either uh, ceiling mounted and just pushed away from the wall, or for example, on a cantilever, like on the far side of this slide. But the idea here is that you're getting some separation from the wall so you can get a nice, even, uniform fill on that wall. So they're regularly used as accent lighting to highlight visual focal points or direct focus as you come into a space. And you can also use them as task lighting to highlight a vertical surface, for example, a whiteboard or a poster wall. Typically, you're looking at direct uh, direct distributions, and these luminaires are going to be bilaterally symmetric, unlike the quadrilaterally symmetric troughers, because you can only cut them in half along this line, uh, because along this line, they are pushing light towards the wall. And again, You've got lenses and reflectors. Also, shielding is commonly used to uh, provide glare control for these guys. They're oftentimes linear, but I also included an example of the downlight form factor uh, here, which are using, uh, using either uh, angled, uh, angled sources or, or a um, asymmetric reflector to push light specifically onto the walls. Now, grazers, a lot, of, a lot of people think that grazers and washers are the same thing. They're really not. And the main difference here is that grazers are right against the wall. So you can see that in the slot right here. And that's why I chose this particular image. So you can see there's like no separation between this uh, grazer and the wall that it's illuminating. The main purpose of this is to highlight the texture of a wall. So you can see that this creates contrast and shadow, which makes that wall visually interesting. If you're talking about drywall, you probably want to go with a washer. But if you spent the money to texture your wall like this, grazing is definitely the kind of source you need. So these really aren't task lights. This is just accent lighting, creating a point of visual interest in the architecture. And you're usually going to either recess them into the ceiling right above that wall, or you'll actually have a cove. So you'll, you'll have a pocket, uh, like I've shown on the, the top right corner here. So a cove or a pocket in the architecture to hide that luminaire, in which case it's just a surface mount. All of these are linear sources uh, because you want to create a solid line of light above that feature wall. And that brings me to cove lighting. So cove lighting is light grazing, but not quite the same. Um, and the main difference is in the architecture, 
but you have different uh, distributions. So a grazer has an extremely narrow distribution. So when you see the candela plot, it's very characteristic because it's tight and sharp. Uh, whereas a cove light looks a little more like a wall grazer, but it's or a wall washer rather, but it's mounted like a wall grazer. And so you can see the really uh, common application here where you have that pocket in the architecture and lights tucked in behind the pocket. It's great for creating that shadowless ambient fill. Uh, it's also great for creating that impression of spaciousness. There's a lot of reasons to like cove lighting, though you do have some loss of efficacy here in the sense that a lot of the light coming out of that luminaire, it will be absorbed by the surfaces of the cove and the ceiling before it makes it down to your work plane. So oftentimes you're going to be in a setup like this one here, where you have a cove, actually, look how shallow that cove is. This is one of Sean Good's projects. And I absolutely love what they did here. They're using the super low profile, essentially like LED tape, but you know, fancy LED tape because this is architectural grade. And, and so you get that super narrow cove. I love it. Um, but you often want to supplement that light, knowing that you have a lot of losses uh, from bouncing it off the ceiling. You want to supplement that with some down lights, uh, like you see right here, so that you get light directly out of the work plane as well. Sconces. Sconces are lovely accent or decorative lights. Um, they're great for pathfinding. So if you want to direct your focus and guide people towards an entrance, for example, uh, sconces are a great way to do that. You can bracket those entrances, you can bracket openings to hallways, so on and so forth. Um, again, bringing us back to the difference between general diffuse and uh, direct indirect. A lot of these are going to be direct indirect because they're cutting off those glare angles right around 90 degrees vertical. So you, you definitely uh, care about the shielding to cut off those glare angles. And that's going to uh, give you uh, these kind of nice distributions. You can get them in super narrow distributions or super wide ones, depending on whether you're lighting a column or, for example, a wall. Also, sconces often come with a wide range of decorative finishes so that you can match basically any kind of look or feel that you're, you're going for. And then, of course, we have purely decorative fixtures. Um, here's a sconce uh, mounted on the wall that is a peacock. Um, you know, chandeliers, Edison bulbs, I would argue, are essentially purely decorative fixtures because they're meant to be direct view. Um, so there's a huge range here, but I wanted to include this term because if you're looking at decorative fixtures on a manufactured website, you're going to get things like this and not things like pendants and troffers. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that you can design and have built custom luminaires for specific applications and projects. Like this chandelier here, I think it's extremely unlikely that this is an off-the-shelf chandelier. This is almost certainly something custom built for this particular ballroom. And there are groups, there are small outfits that are dedicated to building custom luminaires and helping you design them. So it's definitely an option if you're trying to create a real point, a real feature point of visual interest. And then lastly, we get into portable luminaires, which typically you're now we're skewing away from, uh, from architectural applications. However, there are some uses in architecture, um, oftentimes for with task lighting. So you might supplement uh, in an office, you might supplement the overhead ambient lighting with task lighting at the user's desk because they usually come with switches right there on the unit. So it makes it easier to user control. You can also more easily move them.
position them and re-aim them yourself because these are all self-contained luminaires that stand up on their own. So they do have architectural applications, but oftentimes you're not going to find these particular types of luminaires in the architectural section of a manufacturer's website. Okay, real quick on markets. Um, I don't want to go into any detail on any of this, actually, because there's a lot of information uh, to be had here. I do want to point out that all of these markets exist. I want you to at least know that they exist because when, say, for example, you go to Cooper Lighting's website, you can actually select basically all of these options. The option you want to select to get you the kind of luminaires you're actually going to use for your design projects is architectural interior luminaires. And these are the luminaires that have those cut sheets with those extensive configuration options and a huge variety of control options. Um, these are meant to be installed by contractors. So you typically don't buy them as a consumer. You buy them as a lighting designer and they're going to be shipped to a project site and installed by an electrical contractor. Um, the best efficacy, the best reliability, the best quality of light, the most precise distributions all come from architectural interior lighting. So when you're looking at those 135 lumens per watt LED fixtures, you're not looking at residential consumer grade fixtures, you're looking at an architectural fixture. Architectural exteriors is another big market, very similar to the interior architectural market in the sense that you have an enormous range of configuration and control options. Um, but the difference here is these are going to be, uh, have more robust housings so that they are fully protected from the elements. And also because they're exterior, you have less access control of the space. You want these to be more tamper proof as well. And of course, we have what you're all familiar with, the residential and consumer market. So this includes like a lot of your common A lamps and whatnot, a variety of typical uh, residential fixtures. Um, you're not going to have as many options on this. They basically are, are telling you what you want and need, and you need to accept that, or you can go to Home Depot instead of Lowe's, I guess. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of options here. And uh, these aren't garbage fixtures, but they're designed to be cost-effective, not super reliable, long-lived, and efficient. Industrial luminaires. So these are those, those like giant high bays. So you're talking about like really high output type fixtures. And you're also talking about fixtures that have weirdly specific protections in the housing. So you can have these things that can be run over by a truck uh, or can operate in, you know, in super high temperature environments uh, or even corrosion and acid resistance. So if you have a, if you need a luminaire that can get run over by a car, industrial is probably the market segment you're looking for. Exterior lighting is a huge area of lighting and definitely something that you will become familiar with uh, if you go on in lighting here at Penn State. And these are your general exterior fixtures, a lot of floods uh, and area lights here. This is where the bug rating really comes in handy. Of course, emergency and life safety is an important part of lighting. I'm not asking you to do this for your project. Uh, but nonetheless, this is oftentimes within the lighting designers' uh, roles, and uh, and there's a there's a specific market segment dedicated to compliance with emergency and life safety regulations. Oftentimes, that means these things come with a battery on board so that they can operate independently after a power loss. Landscape lighting is fun. I, I really enjoy landscape lighting. Uh, these are, you know, like small, low-profile, aimable luminaires uh, that are meant to be user-adjustable. 
Um, and of course, they're all IP rated. So there's some, some great products in that area if you're looking for landscape lighting. Um, horticultural lighting, obviously for growing pot or the euphemism is tomatoes, it's for growing pot. Um, they no longer actually have to be these purple monsters. Uh, we've found uh, with the, the latest research that, uh, that green light is still utilized by plants, even if it is in smaller quantities. So for the most part, we move back to primarily white light sources. Also, we're just really good at white LEDs now. And so uh, oftentimes we'll just get more total light out of a white LED instead of trying to play around with the spectrum and, and cut out the greens. Sports lighting is a huge market. Uh, you're talking about extremely expensive installations of, of very, very specific lights. These things actually come with like, like aiming guides on them. So you can like crank this around to, you know, tenths of a degree. So you can get very, very precise aiming. Automotive, obviously a big market. Um, we've got theatrical and I won't go into any detail there. I will say there is a theatrical lighting design course available at Penn state for those of you who are interested and you can take it as an elective, especially if, well, really only if you're specializing in lighting. Um, but there is a, uh, there is a architectural lighting design course available to you. And, uh, finally my, my particular market entertainment lighting. Uh, which is like theatrical, except it's cheaper and lighter weight, so you can haul that stuff into the middle of the woods. Okay, that's your market segments. Now you know they exist enough on that. The main thing you need to know about this is when you go to any of these manufacturers' websites that I'm showing you right here, what you're looking for is architectural interiors. That's the market segment that you want. and. When you're looking at these major manufacturers, like I have right next to me, almost all of these guys are going to have, you know, half or more of these options available to you. So make sure to start in the right place. But these are all clickable links. Uh, they're also available in the lecture slides I uploaded. Uh, so these are, this is a great resource to help get you started so you can find the light sources you're going to need for your projects. So that brings me to the conclusion of this lecture. I know that uh, we cruise through a lot of content fast. Like I said, don't worry too much about the market segments other than make sure you're in architectural interiors. Um, you do want to pay attention to the application vocabulary uh, because that's going to educate which fixtures you look up, which will bring you to your cut sheets. And the cut sheets are where you're going to specify the options that you need for your specific application, which in turn will get you to the right IES file. So you can actually load that luminaire into your project. And that's the process of specifying luminaires. Thank you for sticking with me. <laughs>